Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Dr. Odegaard and Dr. Kavaraki for inviting me. And I'm not imaging, I'm just an imaging guy. I'm, my lab doesn't do or don't do any uh, big data or machine learning. But I'm going to talk about this new idea of live real-time imaging in animals and in human, where there is a potential in the near future for a lot of application of big data and machine learning. So I'm going to show you some of the recent uh, work from my lab. And it's a very collaborative project. So uh, many of my graduate students and postdocs are involved, including our RISE collaborator, Dr. Dan Carson. Um, so uh, with, with, with that, I'll give you some of the state of the art in imaging right now. So there is a confocal microscopy, PET, uh, magnetic resonance, ultrasound, all have their place. But as you see in this chart, there is a problem with the penetration depth and the sensitivity. For example, in MRI, which is awesome for deep tissue imaging, but the penetration depth also is really great, but it, the resolution doesn't work very well. While on the other hand, confocal microscopy, which is awesome in terms of uh, resolution, but the penetration depth is very poor, so it doesn't really work well in live human imaging. So uh, MRI is a versatile technique, is non-invasive, non-ionizing radiation, and very good for soft tissue imaging, but the two fundamental flaws in it is low sensitivity and low specificity. So the goal of my lab research for the last 10 years when I became an independent faculty, uh, before I moved to MD Anderson, I was a professor in bioengineering at uh, US of Southern California, our goal was to increase both the sensitivity and the specificity of MRI for live imaging on human. So the way we do that, this is a technique which we, many of this audience may not, may not heard of. It's called hyperpolarization. So what you're seeing right now is the state in a conventional MRI. So the spins essentially cancel each other out. We have a small signal, and we average that out to get a signal inside an MRI machine uh, where you get some signal, we average that over like a half an hour. So if you ever volunteered for MRI experiment, you have to sit in the MRI for at least 15 or 20 minutes, which is not very fun, very claustrophobic. However, in hyperpolarization, we play with the physics. Fundamentally, we change the signal so that we get, get over 100,000 fold signal enhancement. And this is done by changing the polarization level. Instead of moving to high magnetic field, we essentially create a, create a high spin order, which leads to a huge signal, and we can then see things which you cannot see before. This, this enables us to do live real-time imaging of metabolic system as well as molecular imaging. So I'm giving you some example. So there are multiple techniques which you can do that. Earlier, we used to work on Pasadena technique. I'm not going to physics of that, but most of the work I'm going to show you is by DNP method called dynamic nuclear polarization. The reason we have moved to that because it's very easy to get approved by FDA. So at MD Anderson, in very near future, we are trying to do clinical trial on cancer patients. And we have the, one of the first uh, clinical machine is now just been cited there, and we are working on the FDA approval for that. So uh, this is the data from on the very early, like 10 years ago. I'm going to show you while we inject a hyperpolarized compound into the brain of a mouse. So I hope the video actually works. This is in real time. All you just see is the real time imaging of brain vasculature. Clearly, it's not working. Oops. Okay, I hope this works now. Let's see. No, uh, it'll be much more exciting to show you. But this is, just in case the video doesn't work, I have a backup to show you a heart image. So this is a one single shot of a hyperpolarized molecule coming to the heart of a, of a pig. And you can actually see in real time, all the three arteries lighting up in, th in 10 seconds. I really hope the video actually worked because that was pretty dramatic. Uh, this is in the brain. Uh, Tina, is going to make it to work by any way. This is in uh, the video actually shows the timeline of that. Uh, so this is one of the earlier work where we are trying to focus if the technique actually works. But we, what we quickly found that this is great images to impress the audience. But for FDA, people can already do that by uh, not the same resolution, uh, but by all this other MRI-based technique, which doesn't have any market for it. So what we quickly figured out that just imaging is not exciting. We have to get the molecular imaging. Means can we see the metabolism unfolding in a live intact human in milliseconds or in seconds? And that led to the whole, uh, I'm going to show you the data. But I hope this actually works. Yeah, she's making it. Because that was, now the screen doesn't. Yeah. So you will see the first bolus going to the carotid artery. 
it, you can see the two arteries near the neck of the pig, and you can see the brain vasculature lits up. And the signal, of course, that what goes up shall come down by entropy. So the signal has a time window of like a minute and a half. So the signal decays. So the very process of imaging essentially extracts the signal out. So this is just to show you an example. Uh, now I'll move to the more, okay. So with the hyperpolarization, we can do non-invasive. This is completely non-invasive and non-toxic because you are just changing the magnetic state. And we can do real-time imaging, and we can do experiment faster and potentially cheaper. It's not cheap yet. So I just throw out the periodic table because we can right now, there are many molecules you can use, but we're only right now using carbon and silicon. Part of the reason is carbon is a part of our, our organic biological cycle, and silicon has a other reason. I'm going to show you some of the data later. But uh, for this audience, I'm going to give you three case studies. One is how can we measure the aggressiveness in pancreatic cancer? And then can you image immunotherapy resistance? And finally, on a totally different modality of this application, is silicon hyperpolarization for non-invasive colonoscopy. Each of them has a huge application in future data science. I, I, want, I want to emphasize the word future because at this time, we're only scratching the surface. So I'm going to show this biochemical cycle from the first year biochemistry book. All you need to focus on, normal cell, uh, take glucose, and the glucose goes into pyruvic acid and get thrown out as carbon dioxide in our mitochondria. But if you work out, or if you have cancer, a part of the metabolism, pyruvic acid is moved to lactic acid, which causes the soreness in the muscle when you work out at the end of, the, of a day. But in, in cancer, lactic acid is the predominant metabolism. And this is well-known biochemistry figured out by Warburg in 1924. And so what we're going to do is to image the rise of lactic acid in a live uh, animal, and they able, you can only do that because the signal of pyruvic acid we're injecting is so high because of the hyperpolarization, so the biochemistry takes over and you can able to image that in real time. So what you are expected to see is, this is a mouse, and we have a, this is a mouse with pancreatic tumor, and these are like patient-derived, means the patient come to MD Anderson, they get the surgery, we take the tumor out, and then grew that on the mouse. So different patient have different level of aggressiveness of cancer. So we can able to study them in real time in mouse in of patient because in mouse, you have a shorter time window, so you can try that with different therapies. And if the therapy work in mice, you can then translate that to the patient. So this kind of new eye is a platform technology where you're trying to do. So what to expect in a mouse? So this is in seconds, x, y axis. So the moment you inject pyruvic acid, within like three or four seconds in the mouse, in the tumor, you see the rise of lactic acid which is because the metabolism is different in, in the tumor itself. However, if, a, if you apply a therapy, and the therapy actually works, you see the reduction in lactic acid. So you can measure this response in real time in live animal. So, and I'm go, going to show you two techniques. One is, in hyperpolarization, you are measuring the dynamic rate of metabolism inside the tumor, like a cars on a freeway. But also, after the tumor, after the experiment is over, you can sack the tumor, and you can measure all the metabolism by both a mass spectroscopy or by NMR spectroscopy. And then you get the static picture of the metabolism in the tumor, like a car's in a parking lot. So you're using this two dual modality here. So again, we use multiple patient-derived tumor of different level of aggressiveness, which is well-established in patient. So we took four uh, pancreatic cancer patient, and the tumors are engrafted in four mice. The reason we selected these four, because they're well, very differentiated aggressiveness profile. One of them, which we call it um, PTX148, is super aggressive. Essentially, in case of mice, the mice essentially dies in, in a month. And the, in this particular patient, the patient dies within a month as well. So pancreatic cancer, just to let you know, is one of the most aggressive cancer you can ever get. It's just terrible. So we want to extend how in the short time window the patient have, can we actually do some meaningful therapy in them? And in another pancreatic cancer patient, 142, it is relatively less aggressive. What I mean is that in this case, it is almost 130 days the mice essentially survive. So, and we also see them the growth curve. Now, this is the more exciting real-time in vivo metabolic data. In the least aggressive mice, and this is all in 120 seconds after injection, the pyruvic acid is injected, and you see some lactic acid rising. And in the most aggressive mouse, the pyruvic acid has never had the time to grow. Almost there is a metabolic machine sitting inside the animal, which is eating up the pyruvic acid and converting into lactic acid. This is just it's enormously, and we can able to image that in live intact mouse. When you plot them, this is what we see. In the most aggressive mouse, 
pyruvic acid comes in, this is all in time is in, in seconds, lactic acid is immediately convert, and the pyruvic acid immediately convert to lactic acid. And the least aggressive mouse, it is very slow. It is not it taking a long time to convert. Now, we took the tumor of all the four mice after the experiment is done. We sacked them. We quantified the metabolic uh, profile. We also saw that the most aggressive tumor has the highest level of lactic acid, and the least aggressive one has the lowest amount of lactic acid. And so when you plot them, this is what I want to bring your attention, the total lactic acid, which is measured from direct measurement of lactic acid in the tumor, and the dynamic lactic to pyruvic conversion rate from the real-time metabolic imaging is a perfect straight line. So what that means in that in near future, we can probably get rid of the whole idea of biopsying the pancreatic cancer patient, because we can just bring the patient in, just inject the hyperpolarized pyruvic acid in an MRI machine, measure the lactic acid level, and in the curve, we should be able to tell what is the total lactic acid in the tumor itself, and as well as the aggressiveness of the tumor. So this is one of the applications which we are going to do that in MD Anderson. And I'll quickly switch gear here. So we all know about immunotherapy. It is Jim Allison won the Nobel Prize last year, and it is really exciting for the patient which works. And that should be un in the, uh, underlined, because it is an awesome technique if it works, but there's a lot of patient it doesn't work. And right now, it is an enormously expensive pro uh, because immunotherapy is very expensive. And each dosage is in the range of $25,000. And so when the patient gets it and doesn't work, it is just uh, it's a huge money wastage, essentially. So, but there's no way to figure out in advance if it's going to work or not. So what I'm going to do, this is the immu uh, immunotherapy profile in the, one of the most successful cancer where it worked. It's melanoma. So in melanoma, it worked for almost 40% of the patient. But there is also a lot of patients, it doesn't work. And so what we're trying to do, in working with Jim Allison's lab, we developed this mouse model of immunoresistance. Means there is a family of mouse, which has melanoma in them. And after first generation, uh, there are a few which, re which develop immunoresistance to immunotherapy. And in, after the fourth generation, what we saw, that it doesn't work at all. It's completely resistant to immunotherapy. So we grew the mice, bred them in our uh, MD Anderson, and I'm just going to quick, lead, because there are a lot of physics behind that and biology. So this is the bottom line, is that in the immunotherapy responding mouse, we saw the lactate to pyruvate conversion is lot, uh, so there's a lot less lactic acid is forming in immunotherapy resistant. And in immunotherapy responding, the lactic acid production is a lot higher. So essentially, we can able to predict just from the looking at the how much lactic acid is produ producing in the tumor itself. And these are all from the tumor of the mouse in real time. This again in 120 seconds of injection. And we can able to tell which is responding to immunotherapy and which is not going to respond. So we are about to start a clinical trial on melanoma patient at MD Anderson to see if we can able to do that. So I will skip all of that because my time is up. I want to show you something else uh, is we are now extend this technique to silicon. So uh, those who are over the 40 have gone through the colonoscopy, and which is not fun. So the idea is that can we essentially bring a smoothie of uh, silicon particles, which has antibody uh, of uh, colorectal polyps, which you call it mucin. This is work done with Dan Carson's lab. And the patient is going to drink the smoothie and where there is tumor in the precancer of polyps, they're going to just lit up because the silicon in the signal will be hyperpolarized. So you're able to hyperpolarize silicon particles with the mucin antibody in it. And this is the first proof of concept. We bred a mouse with, uh, which uh, has colorectal cancer in it. And believe it or not, MD Anderson has mouse colonoscopy. So we're able to tell this mouse have, uh, so this image, the videos are too gross to be shown, but essentially, <laughs> We, can, we know where the tumors are. This is from the colonoscopy of the mouse. Then we inject hyperpolarized uh, silicon with a mucin antibody attached on it, and half and 10 minutes later, we are able to see where the exact where the locations of the tumor are. And of course, the reviewer come back and uh, give us to do the controls, so we essentially develop mouse model. We do not have the tumor. We have the tumor, but doesn't express as mucin, where you don't see any of the signal there. We also use a chemical control, so we add the silicon particle with PEG in it instead of the mucin. There also we don't see any signal. Then you also block the sites, and then also you don't see any signal. We did all the controls. So essentially, we now have a technique by which we can do targeted molecular imaging, which used to be the realm of PET or SPECT, but you can do that in MRI right now, thanks to hyperpolarization. So the bottom line is, so by enhancing the signal of MRI, we can now able to image metabolic events and the receptors 
of oncogene activity. And this is an area which is, we're just barely scratching the surface, where, we, where data science and big data can have a big role. And I, I think uh, this is part of my lab, who have done all the work, a lot of funding agencies, thank you. And I just want to end with this. This is the entire metabolic cycle of the human biological system. So right now, we can only track uh, with all the technique available, only like, like uh, 80 metabolites. And with this hyperpolarization and with the big data, that is one of the big emphasis on the real time metabolic profiling in cancer patient and other cancer where metabolism is inactive. So anyway, that's probably this, with a, we are scratching the top of the pyramid. We'll see how far it goes. And thank you for your attention. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.